Okay, we are again back in the morning, our 6.30 teaching schedule. And uh, we are very fortunate today. Again, we have Dr. Lulu Matthews. I know that uh, 40 or 50, 49 and 50 people, those who have joined, I don't think that no one knows Dr. Lulu. Dr. Lulu is a important and famous uh, person of this country. Medicine is concerned. And uh, I think first pediatrician who has opted for uh, palliative medicine uh, as a um, specialty or as a chance for her career. And I think she has contributed a lot as far as pediatric palliative care is concerned. Besides her pediatric palliative care contribution, I think she has an immense contribution to this country. Uh, she is program director of academics at Institute of Palliative Medicine, Calicut. She is the academic coordinator of National Fellowship in Palliative Medicine. Many of uh, you must have done this fellowship. She is also chairperson of Board of Examiners of Indian Association of Palliative Care, which is going on since 2007 without any problem. And I think it is improving day by day. She is also section editor of Indian Journal of Palliative Care. And she is also mentor of two important programs that started with Stanford, that is Impact Head and Neck uh, Program India and then quality improvement program uh, equip india she is also postgraduate teacher diplomat of a national board program at malabar institute of medical sciences calicut kerala uh, we know dr lulu is not uh, in india in these days but still she is committed and she is taking all her whatever commitment for the as far as academics is concerned she is uh, doing from america so, Dr. Lulu, thank you very much, and please start. Thank you very much, uh, Sushma. So, let me share the screen. Nisha, can I? Okay, my dear friends, see, uh, this will be a totally out of focus topic. Again, coming back to symptom management, because we are in this uh, IAPC session, you know, we are now in, I mean, how to set up palliative care clinic in rural setting, urban setting, medical colleges, private hospitals, like that. So this is a totally different topic now. Why this happened is because this topic, I should have taken it in last October. Then a mishap occurred in my life and I had to cancel my session that day. And the second time, Nisha fixed it somewhere in March. And that was the day I had booked my ticket for my journey to India. So that again got changed. And this is the third time now. For you, April 5th is a Monday morning there. But for me, speaking from a different time zone, it is Easter day. And Easter, you know, is the day of resurrection. So I am very happy that I am I'm coming out with this topic for the IAPC Academic session on this day. Hopefully this will serve as a resurrection in my life too. Okay, so now coming to the my topic. The topic allotted to me is approach to managing non-pain symptoms in children. So which are the non-pain symptoms? So what I have chosen, breathlessness, nausea, vomiting, and constipation, because these are the four most common symptoms with which children come to palliative care clinic. And again, I have been listening to these lectures. I mean, they are all done in such high standard with so much references, evidence-based medicine. I feel, some of you might feel that this topic is so simple. I mean, this, I have made it very simple. I have made it very, very practically oriented. There aren't any references. There aren't any evidence-based medicine to boast of also. But at the end of it, I have made it very short. I think I'll get over it in about 30 to 40 minutes. If you have any doubts, I'll be happy to clarify it. Okay, so I bring to you greetings from IPM. 
where I have working for the past 12 years now, since my retirement from the Government Medical College. Okay. So this is, history is, you know, his story. But here, our patient is Minnu. So it is her story. So it's a four-year-old Minnu with progressive PNAT, primitive neuroectodermal tumor. You know, PNATs are a group of grade four tumors, fast growing malignant tumors. And when first diagnosed in about one third of patients, it is disseminated and beyond any curable state. And there are two types, central and peripheral. Central starting in the brain or spinal cord and peripheral type involving the sympathetic nervous system or soft tissues and bones. And this group actually arises from the neural crust and the primitive neuroendocrine cells. Why I am telling this? Because more common is the central one, but our Minnu had the uh, peripheral type. Now, the most common sites of PNAT metastasis, okay, they are, okay, they are the lung, the bone, and the bone marrow. Treatment options include radiation, chemotherapy, clinical trials, and clinical trials with new chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, drugs. You see, when there are so many treatment options, one thing is very clear. There is no definite curative treatment. That is it. That is true in PNAT also. So here, Minnu, she was diagnosed a few months back. And at the time of diagnosis, very, very disseminated. And she was having the pelvic type, that is the peripheral type, starting from the right ovary. Surgery is not possible because of the vast metastasis. It was not done too. But she was undergoing chemotherapy, had undergone some radiation, and she was on immunotherapy also. She was quite symptom-free till about 10 to 12 days back. And for a pain, she was started on morphine. Her pain was less, but now increasing discomfort for the past three to four days. She was a quite sick child and hence referred to palliative care clinic. Okay, sorry. So her mother's version of symptoms. Now I must tell something about her mother. We all think if parents are doctors or nurses, we have a tough time in managing children. But I can tell you the toughest, the major problem is if the parents happen to be biology, zoology, or botany professors or teachers, because they think they know everything. And it's very difficult to make them understand, very difficult. So this mother, she was a uh, biology professor in one of the colleges. And her symptoms, her version of symptoms, my Minnu is sick all over, not eating anything. If she eats anything, she brings it out. She's sleepy, but cannot sleep. In between, she gets up, asks for food, vomits it out. In between, she howls, maybe due to pain, because she hugs her abdomen. And then she told me, doctor, we do, do, don't you know that her problem is in the ovary? I never knew that children could be having problems in the ovary. So as far as that mother was concerned, that was a new knowledge which she had acquired. And she continued, at times, Minu cries, pressing her head. She cannot even breathe properly. So these are mother's version of her symptoms. But now as doctors, we should have our own version, our own perception, what were they? Not eating or eating very little. Why have I put it at the top? Because you see parents, are very upset if their children are not eating. So we might not feel that it's not very important, but as far as the parent is concerned, it's very, very important. That is why I've put it right at the top. She's unable to sleep, she's vomiting, she has pain in the abdomen, query headache, and she has <coughs> These are the symptoms from our perception. Now, how to proceed and where to start? See, if it is an adult patient, we can ask, which is the most distressing symptom? But that's not possible here. So I want you to put down your views on the chat box. I told you my talk is very short, so you will have time. 
So please put it down on the chat box. And Nisha, please tell me if anybody is putting anything in the chat box. How to proceed, where to start, which symptom to start managing, which symptom should we manage first? Please come out because I want you to think. Anybody has anything? Nisha? Uh, no, madam, nothing on the chat. Nothing. I mean, no. somebody should. Yeah. Something. Dr. Arun is here, ma'am. Uh, he will be managing the chat box, so he will help okay. you. Okay. I don't, yeah. I don't. Yes, Lulu, madam, there is nothing. Uh, abdominal pain, nothing. something is coming. Okay, abdominal pain. Yeah, but you should be having something. So many symptoms, you, you know, and the child has come to you. And somewhere you should start. No, madam, a lot, lot of things are coming. Nausea, pain, uh, headache, abdominal pain. Uh, nausea, not altogether. So they will start with nausea. Somebody will start with pain. Then, what else? Breathlessness. Breathlessness. See, so are you getting the point now? When a child comes like this, this is one difference. You cannot ask the child, which is the most, uh, I mean, distressing sim symptom. But we have to start somewhere. So where to start? Now, when they came to the palliative care clinic, the grandmother was having Minu in her lap. And the mother was having a big bag with several files. And on questioning, I found out that it is the grandmother who looks after the looks after Minu because the mother has to go for work. Her husband is also is an engineer working, so he also leaves the home early morning. They have two children. The younger one, one is only one year old, and that child is right now being looked after by the husband at home. So it's the grandmother who is looking after Minu routinely. That is an additional point. So now where to start? Yeah. See, you have to observe what is happening. You have to observe because right now the child is howling, crying, groaning, fretting, angry, distressed. And you can't do anything. How do you find out which is the most distressing symptom? So what we did was we asked the grandmother to go and sleep with the, lie down on a cot with the child. So the grandmother was off in one corner of the ward. From, so I could observe what is happening to the child from where we were si sitting. At the same time, I had to get, go through the case sheet because the mother had a huge file with her. So I came to know quite comfortable till 10 days back, started having abdominal pain, started on ibuprofen three times a day, no relief, started on morphine, 2.5 mg fourth hourly, upscale to 5 mg, now getting 10 mg and last 24 hours, two RD morphine taken. And still the child is uncomfortable as ever. And she's also on some other drugs as I learned from looking after the uh, case sheet. She was an on cetron and the mother, she had a bottle of apripitant syrup and she was very she was boasting. In fact, my brother is working in US and when I told him that she's having incessant vomiting, she, he sent this through one of his friends. So when should I give this? How should I give this? So that was it, appropriate. Then the child was on oral chemo drug and she was also getting palliative chemo injection weekly once. So this was the prescription. Now, how to proceed from there? See, after the, the grandmother went to sleep with the child, the child was not sleeping, she was fretful. I mean, so many uh, uncomfortable. And then the grandmother came and said, see, she's, Minu is asking for ice cream. Yeah, ice cream. Yeah, lately for three to four days now, she is not eating anything. She likes only ice cream. And for a wonder, she has started developing a liking for milk. And she is drinking quite a lot of milk too. Okay, and the grandmother also bent down and said, please uh, don't make my child suffer anymore. One sentence, that is all. The grandmother has not opened her mouth at all then. Please don't make my child suffer anymore. So we told her, okay, you give ice cream because that come with ice cream and milk. Minu took it eagerly. 
she took it eagerly during the process suddenly gave a yell and started to cry within minutes she nauseated and vomited out the ice cream okay you so you picture it now what is the inference i want your feedback i don't please tell me what is the inference minu took the there is one more uh, chat coming in madam constipation constipation okay and we are waiting please put in the chat box to request everyone why should the child give a yell raised intracranial pressure severe raised intracranial pressure okay intestinal obstruction intestinal obstruction okay at least people are thinking i only want to make you people think so what is the inference the inference is that taking ice cream eagerly so no oral problems no after stomatitis no glossitis no dysphagia no adenophagia suddenly starts howling so she takes it and then starts howling why it's gastrocolic reflex this is what usually happens so the person who mentioned constipation is right so when a child is constipated when she takes something suddenly she gets the gastrocolic reflex feels like moving the bowel but unable then a colic set in child starts howling and then vomited out what could be the cause of vomiting in minu again on the chat box i don't yes <clears throat> Uh, obstruction in uh, gastrointestinal tract Obst okay people are more focused towards obstruction yeah anything else please put in the chat box if you think wrong again now when you really meet such similar patients you will think right that is it severe colic pain somebody has wrote morphine induced Huh. dyspepsia due to ibuprofen gastritis huh. good, good 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 i am very happy so cause of vomiting it could be morphine induced the child is not getting when the child was started on morphine nobody had started him on any anti emetic it could be due to gastric irritation by nsaid it could be due to constipation it could be due to the disseminated disease all four are possible those could be causes of vomiting in minnu so now what is the stat management we have four causes what is the stat management again on the chat box arun yes uh, please put in the chat box to request everyone you think wrong now you will start thinking right later on okay uh it's coming in number one is uh, enema then ppi better to provide hmm. management of colic pain laxatives okay okay at least you thinking very very happy so you see it could be due to morphine if it is due to morphine we have to give anti emetic okay if it is due to nsaid we have to give a ppi if it is due to constipation you have to do pre like that it goes but what to give as the first step that will be pantoprazole somebody has mentioned why because you see you now you go back to the history child was started on ibuprofen what the doctor had prescribed was 5 ml 8 hourly the pharmacist didn't have syrup so he gave 400 mg tablet and told them to take half three times a day that is too much and again without ppi and again you see what the grandmother told she she never used to like milk but for the past 2 to 3 days drinking milk and again a liking for ice cream so from all of this we know the main symptom is a burning gastric pain so we gave injection pantoprazole okay after that what to do we have to examine the child but the child is fretful angry and so sometimes you know you may have to give an injection medasol and sort of and to make the child relaxed only then you will be able to do anything especially if the child is fretful angry throwing around like this our minnu so that was given and palpated the abdomen 
and palpating the abdomen, we found lower abdominal distension. What could be the cause? Chat box. What yes, could be the yes. cause? <clears throat> cause of lower abdominal distension. Yeah. Come on the chat box. Yes, please come on the chat box. Tumor. Tumor. Heart fecal matter. Oh. Okay, lower abdominal distension. It could be due to constipation. It could be due to tumor. It could also be due to bladder. So the child is constipated. Usually when the child is constipated, she also develops urinary retention. So what is to be done now? Chat box. What is to be done now? Yes. Could be constipation. It could be retention of urine. It could be tumor mass. What to do first? Catheterization can be tried. Warm compression of lower pelvis can be tried. See, this is what... See, as far as possible, do non-invasive steps. Take non-invasive steps first. So don't go for catheterization now. Because you see, urinary retention is as a result of constipation. So what can be, what should be done? Do a PRE. Do a PRE. Hard fecal matter, enema was administered. Sometimes what happens, along with the stool, the urine will also start flowing out. But that did not happen in uh, Minu. But even then, don't go for catheterization as the first step. Okay, hot water bag was applied on the tummy. And she's voided large volume of urine and the abdominal distension got reduced. Minu started to sleep. The grandmother, okay. Mother appeared to be satisfied. But we are not sure, you know, biology professor, but we cannot be very sure. But she appeared to be satisfied. So the first, I mean, the, the first step we got over. Now, why is Minu vomiting? She is on morphine. So central mechanism through the CTZ. She is on NSAID, that is gastric irritation. She is constipated. So again, from, uh, from the GIT and the tumor, it is a disseminated tumor that could also be causing the reason for vomiting. So always you should have this picture of vomiting in your mind. Only then you will be able to treat the mechanism responsible for vomiting. Okay, now why pantoprazole? You see, when you talk of drugs causing vomiting, even drugs, you know, they act differently. For example, morphine acts through CTZ. Okay, NSAID acts through the gastric irritation. Amitriptylin causes gastric stasis. Whereas chemotherapeutic drugs direct vagal stimulation. So we cannot say that for all drug-induced vomiting, I will give pantoprazole. You will not be right. You have to consider how is it that the drug is causing vomiting and then treat according to the mechanism. So that's what we have done here. NSI, gastric irritation, and we gave pantoprazole. Okay, now back to Minu. She slept comfortably. He got up, had some more milk, but nausea persisting. She preferred to go home. Why? We told her, stay back for one more, one more day. But then you see the one-year-old child back at home with the husband. So they said they want to go home. They will come back if they have any issues. So if admitted, we could observe her. But because she is going home and because the child is having persisting nausea, before going home, injection haloperidol 0.2 mg was given, not tablet. Because suppose she vomits it out, so injection was given and she was sent home. So you see, we sent her home on ibuprofen syrup in the proper dose. Pandoprazole, morphine, haloperidol, cremafin, oral chemo. She was continuing and emicet. Now, why emicet? Why emicet? Because already she is on haloperidol. Why emicet? She, she was on chemotherapy and she was having a huge tumor in the abdomen. She had undergone radiotherapy. So, so many problems of issues occurring in small intestine and abdomen. And all these, you know, mechanisms, 5-HT3, that is the one which is causing vomiting. So we have to give 5-HT3 antagonist, that is the septrons. 
So that is why in chemotherapy induced vomiting, in uh, post surgical vomiting, post radiation vomiting, septrons are the best. Okay, see what happens in the gut. That is stimulation of gut chemoreceptors, stimulation of gut stretch receptors, stimulation of vagus, sympathetic fibers, secretion of serotonin, histamine, acetylcholine, substance P, and histamine also responsible, mainly responsible for nausea. Substance P acting not only on the receptors in the gut, but also on the vomiting center, acetylcholine increasing, gut motility secretion. So you see, in, all, in such a situation where the gut is affected, either due to surgery, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, cetrons are very good as anti-emetic agents. She was on chemotherapy, so we allowed her to continue emicet. Now, so when she was uh, sent home, uh, three additions we made. We added pantoprazole, we added haloperidol tablet, just two tablets, but uh, two tablets were given. Um, if the nausea uh, continued to be given, then cremaphin syrup was uh, also given. Okay, why cremaphin? You know, what are the common laxatives? One is softness, mainly docusate and liquid paraffin. Second is stimulant, bisacodyl. Bulk forming never ever used in children. And fourth is the osmotics. So these are the four groups. But what are the common laxatives used in children? Liquid paraffin, it's a softener. Docusate is a softener. Cremaffin, magnesium hydroxide with liquid paraffin, softener. Cremaffin plus means it contains also sodium picosulfate. Sodium picosulfate is a stimulant. Bisacodyl stimulant. Milk of magnesia containing magnesium hydroxide, osmotic. In children, usually uh, small children, you know, they don't like stimulants because when you give stimulants, you know, some of that stimulation of the gut and sometimes colic occurs and children become very uncomfortable. So better to start them on softness. That's the reason why she was started on cremaphin. Okay, so next she came on a Saturday, next follow up on Monday. She was quite comfortable. We didn't receive any phone call from her. No pain, no RD morphine, no vomiting, moving bowel without any difficulty. But she was breathless and prefers to be taken in arms, fretful and crying. What could be the cause? Chat box, what could be the cause? Cause for breathlessness. Uh, okay. Lung metastasis can be a cause. Lung metastasis. Hmm. Pleural effusion from the disease. Effusion. Tumor compression and tumor metastasis. Yeah. Lung mets. Okay. Anemia can be a cause. Yeah. Anemia. Because you see, most common sites of metastasis are bone. Hmm. Bone marrow, lungs. Remember that. Bone, bone marrow, lungs. So what could be the causes you have mentioned? She was very pale. Hemoglobin was just six grams. Examination revealed dullness of the right hemithorax, but not stony dull. Not sto sto stony dull. How to proceed now? Chat box. How to proceed? How to proceed for breathlessness? Yeah. How to proceed? So examin a physical examination and then blood transfusion. Physical examination done. Right yeah. hemithorax dull, not stony dull. Chest x-ray can be ordered. Chest x-ray. Because of anemia, blood transfusion can be considered. Okay. Transfusion. Right, right. Very, very good. So better than chest x-ray, you know, better would be a UST. UST. Because that is better. We did it. No pleural effusion, but mass suggesting of mets, mass on the right hem hemithorax. Okay, so what can be done now? As you said, two units PRBC were given on two, two days, on two days to correct the anemia. She didn't have pleural effusion, but she had lung parenchyma, I mean mets. So we gave her tablet Dexona 
ഫോർ എം ജി ഓ ഡി ആഫ്റ്റർ ബ്രേക്ക്ഫാസ്റ്റ് ഫോർ ത്രീ ഡേയ്സ് ഇൻ ദ ഹോപ്പ് ദാറ്റ് ടെക്സോണ വിൽ റെഡ്യൂസ് ദി പെരി ട്യൂമർ എഡിയമ വിച്ച് വുഡ് ഓൾസോ ബി കോൺട്രിബ്യൂട്ടിംഗ് ടു ഹർ ബ്രത്ത്ലെസ്നെസ് സി ഡിസ്നിയ ഈവൻ എ ചൈൽഡ് ഡിസ്നിയ ഇസ് സെയിം ആസ് എൻ അഡൽറ്റ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് അൺകംഫർട്ടബിൾ അവയർനെസ് ഓഫ് വൺ സോൺ ബ്രീതിങ് and which will restrict the child's activity child will become um, i mean i mean dependent on others and frustration anger depression okay and it really it is bad breathing as far as a child is concerned so that is what the mother was telling she cannot even breathe properly okay so so many causes for dyspnea but here in this child it was tumor involvement of the lung parenchyma it could be the effect of radiation and chemotherapy causing delayed or early fibrosis it could be anemia only 6 grams hemoglobin hepatomegaly because um, a great uh, distant me- metastasis and along with that hepatomegaly tender hepatomegaly is a part of congestive heart failure and also cardiac failure so what have we done we have given two prbc hopefully it will correct anemia and the cardiac failure and then we have given tablet dexona hopefully to decrease the uh, peri tumor edema and the child is already on tab- I mean, tablet ibuprofen to decrease the stretching of the liver capsule okay now breathlessness so here in this minnu it was due to lung mets mainly due to anemia and that's what we have a try to manage also hence we gave a trial of steroids and prbc transfusion okay so managing breathlessness was done two measures prbc and tablet dexona okay now prescription now what did we add we added derfilin syrup 5 ml eight hourly and also dexona to be continued three more days at home already on pantoprazole okay then at follow up what happened hmm? uh, so gradually the pain is decreasing morphine was down scaled to 5 for 5 mg then further reduced to 2.5 mg and two days later she again came back with cough and increasing breathlessness no drop in hemoglobin no pleural effusion we realized our folly what is the folly what is the mistake chat box yes what is the mistake what can be the mistake yeah there is a mistake decreasing inadvertent the is decreasing the morphine dose a mistake yeah very good that is it morphine was giving her relief for her breathlessness we thought it was only uh, looking after her pain so when the pain was uh, relieved they started down scaling the morphine and when it reached a beyond a certain limit you know she started becoming breathless so again upscaled to 5 mg four hourly that's what was done okay very good you thought of that that and now the mother's doubt what to do with that apripitant that she wanted to give? when to give how to give it has come from us now you know we should not be angry with these mothers we have to explain things not that we have to explain everything to them but some amount of so i'll just tell you see there's an following chemotherapy there's an acute vomiting occurring from few minutes to hours and resolving within 24 hours delayed uh, vomiting occurring usually after 24 hours worst second and third day but it can live long i mean go on up to 6 to 7 days breakthrough vomiting occurring despite antiemetic treatment refractory is unmanageable with the current antiemetic regime and anticipatory suppose somebody today is monday so somebody is having a chemotherapy coming wednesday or thursday monday itself the person starts having nausea vomiting that is anticipatory it is a conditioned response so these are the different types of vomiting so what is the role of a preparant here that's it we should be thinking we should be knowing all this otherwise you know these mothers will look up on the net and come back to us so what are the new antiemetics when is talenosetron uh, the advantage is that the half life is 40 hours as against 4 to 6 hours for ondansetron and 5 to 8 hours for granisetron very effective talenosetron and then epripetent epripetent it tackles both central as well as 
peripheral vomiting. It can be useful in acute as well as delayed vomiting, both. And again, some more de details, you know, I told you about acute vomiting. Cetrons are very good in acute vomiting following chemotherapy. Whereas the inhibitors of NK1 receptors like this epipetan, that is very useful in delayed nausea and vomiting. So that is the difference. So when, you, when a person has vomiting following chemotherapy, take a proper history. If it is acute vomiting occurring within the same day, cetrons would be better. But if it is delayed occurring after four to five days, uh, epipetan will be better. So here we have found out the reason for minus vomiting. It is morphine, it is NSAID, it is constipation, it is tumor. Huh? And, and, and moreover, you know, she's not having any nausea or vomiting now. She is happy with the emicid, um, um, so she does not need a profitan now. Okay, so can it be anticipatory vomiting? Because every Monday she has chemo and she has come back on Saturday. Suppose she comes back uh, with vomiting on Saturday, can be considered anticipatory vomiting and what should be given? Chat box. What is the medicine for anticipatory vomiting? Benzodiazepines. That's the answer. Anybody else? Only one answer. Yeah, more answers, please. Also mention the name of the benzodiazepine if possible. Okay, I'll tell you. I'll give you. Uh, I'll, I'll give an example. You consider an adult patient, CS stomach with massive ascites. Usually the person calls up the palliative care clinic and uh, the doctor, my abdomen the fluid is again collected. I think um, I need to be tapped now. The patient can associate the relief which he will get after tapping of his ascites fluid. But in children, such association is not developed. This cause and effect association is not there. So what I'm trying to say is that in a young child, uh, this anticipatory vomiting need not be given importance, need not be. And our menu is only four year old. But in an older child who can, who knows the cause and effect relationship in those children only, we need consider anticipatory vomiting. That's the point I wanted to make. Again, I missed, I, I failed to tell you something. You remember the mother's complaint? Um, she's always sleeping, but unable to sleep. See, the reason was she was on 10 mg morphine fourth hourly. So what the mother was telling was she was drowsy, but she was not using the word drowsy. She told she's always sleeping, but unable to sleep in between. She, but she thought it, the child was, um, I mean, uh, the, not able to sleep at night, getting up and howling due to pain. Mother does not know all the details, but she was giving the typical history. It was for us to draw the inference from that history. Okay, now let us see if we have managed all her symptoms. One is sick all over, not eating anything, she's eating. If she eats, brings it out, now no vomiting. She cannot sleep, she's sleeping at night. She's asking for food, at times cries pressing her head. She cannot even breathe. Now she's breathing, no dyspnea. She cries pressing her head. That is the symptom which we have not looked at. So what could be the reason? What could be the reason? Yes. Chat box. Press, pressing her head. What could be the reason? Raised intracranial In pressure. pressure. Headache. Okay. Headache because of that. Okay. One. The yeah, other reason. For this, raised intracranial pressure due to brain metastasis. Yeah. Any other possible reason? Okay. See, if you consider like that, what happens? You, you know, and the BG, you have raised your hand. What's it, BG? BG, unmute. Unmute and say you have raised your hand. Do you want to say something? Emicid induced? Hmm? Emicid induced? Emicid induced, okay. Okay.
See, if you think it is raised intracranial tension, you know, we will think I must get a CT scan done. I must get an MRI done. I mean, we should be considering, but consider the simpler and the more practical reasons first. Okay. Raised intracranial tension, you are not wrong in considering, especially since Minu was having vomiting and irritability. Was, not is. Now there is no vomiting. Now she is not irritable also. Okay, but what has happening? She was constipated. So during the time of colic or when she was trying to bear down, see what happens when you try to bear down due to hard stool. At time, there is a momentary increase in, so the child is pressing the hand. That was what the mother was giving importance to. So this was very practical, very simple reason. So now she does not have headache, now she is not irritable, now no vomiting. So raised ICT is not possible here. But if it is continuing, definitely raised ICT would be a cause. Okay, so that is the constipation and consequent bearing down, increasing the IC tension is the culprit. Right, now again, a few days later, the mother came back. She has come, uh, the, pro the professor, she's coming with apripitant, emiset, metoclopramide, and haloperidol, four uh, bottles. Then she's asking, now the grandmother had uh, made a vow that if the child is comfortable, because child came to the palliative care clinic very sick, that she would take the child to a nearby temple. So she was, they were going in a car, but Minnu often, you know, has the tendency to vomit. So which among these to be given? Chat box, she has brought four medications. Chat box. Yes. What is the medicine that can prevent vomiting while going to a pilgrim center? Yeah. Going yeah. Prevention of vomiting. So, scopolamine, haloperidol, metoclopramide, a lot of options are coming in. Hmm. I think this is mostly movement induced vomiting, maybe. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, that that is it. I told you, remember this picture. So you see, here it is uh, morphine, things like that through CTZ. Other impulses from GI, but here it is vestibular mediated. So what we need is actually antihistamines, not any of the drugs which she has brought. Promethazine, diphenhydramine, both of which are easily available. Uh, the, that is it, you know. Sometimes, um, I mean, you get, you become so confused when so many drugs are brought. How can I prescribe a fifth one? But if you are definite about the mechanism of of vomiting, you will definitely write the right drug, prescribe the right drug. Okay. So you you see, but she did not live long. After about a month, she had a peaceful death. But uh, before that. The mother, we could make the mother relaxed and the doctors also became relaxed because palliative care is not only managing the child, but the entire family, the entire family. And you know, before thanking my request to all my palliative care colleagues, a very simple re request. One thing is that you see, whenever you get a child with, who needs palliative care, please admit the child in your unit and look after the child. See, you need not have a palli pediatric palliative care unit to offer palliative care to a child. And don't think that you need a pediatrician. You please uh, remember, Gayatri who has a good palliative care unit in Hyderabad, she is not a pediatrician. Mary Ann Mukadan is not a pediatrician. See, what I am telling is that don't, cons I mean, don't think of, oh, we don't have pediatrician, so I cannot admit children. I'll tell you the reason why it is not easy for you to get pediatrician. See, years back, we only had physicians and then came neuro neurologists, pulmonologists, cardiologists, hepatologists, colonists, and so on. And for the past uh, eight to 10, 10 years now, we, at that time, the, we, we were only pediatricians. And then now branching out into cardiologists, pediatric cardiologists, pediatric endocrinologists, pediatric diabetologists, pediatric thyroidologists, 
and on and on and on. So even those pediatricians who showed some interest in palliative care are moving on to branches like rheumatology, primary immune deficiency, cardiology, neurology, diabetology, so on and so on. It's not easy to get pediatricians to work in your unit. And you remember what, and second reason is, you know, now we have another group, pediatric oncologist. You see, you remember if you heard Spandana's talk, she mentioned there was a senior pedi pediatrician and Spandana was initially very managing it difficult how to get along with her. But my opinion, she was an elderly lady with prudence. So after some time, she knew that, you know, Spandana could help her. But youngsters are not like that. A young pediatric oncologist knows he or she thinks every, she knows everything. And they don't need anybody's support. They don't need anybody's support. They may not even refer patients to you. Yeah, ch ch children to you. But my thing is that now the present setup is that a, a primary palliative care uh, professional like you all, with years of experience in palliative care, and who have the aptitude and the attitude to work along with children is much better than a pediatrician who has no aptitude and no attitude to work in with along with children. So my thing is that you start admitting children in your ward. I mean, it's not at all difficult looking after children because basically what they need is good quality palliative care. See, only the dosing you will find difficult. See, even I, now it is 12 years since I left pediatrics. So even now, when I, I mean, have any doubts, I have doubts very often. I look up and find out what is the correct dose. Years back, everything was on my fingertip or uh, tongue tip or wherever it is. But now I have to go back and refer. Whenever I am in doubt, I always go back and refer. Only the dosing which is important. If you have the attitude and the aptitude, I think you should start admitting. You should start taking care of children. That is the need of the hour. And if you have any doubts, this is all what I have to say. I know this is very simple. No references, no evidence, Smith Smith, nothing. If you have any questions, I shall try to answer. Thank you very much. Now, one thing more, one thing more. See, why I am telling that you will be able to do good. So many would have heard me mention about this book, The Kiss of Life by Imran Hashmi. See, his child, Ayan, was diagnosed with neuroblastoma when he was age three. And you see this Imran could connect with the child, could connect with Ayan's spirituality. Spirituality in children, um, it, it is little different, but after all, it is the connectedness. So Ayan was connected to super figures like Spider-Man, Superman, so on. So Imran Hashmi invented an Iron Man and she sailed through the troublesome period and got the uh, proper management for his son. So if you have the time, please read this book by Imran Hashmi, The Kiss of Life. Okay. So if he, without any palliative care training, could do so much for his child, how much more should we be able to do? Just think that. That will give you the strength to go forward and start looking after children. Thank you very much. Any doubts, welcome. So I will stop the screen sharing. Thank you, Dr. Lulu. It was such a practical, it was too good. All the practical points, I think, all the PGs must have picked up. Arun, any questions in the chat box? Please go ahead. Uh, there are no uh, more questions in chat box, madam. It was very interactive. So all the questions are covered when they were asked. No further questions. So if there will be any further questions, we will forward to it to you, Dr. Lulu. And I just wanted to comment one more thing that when you talk about anticipatory vomiting, uh, I think... Uh, most of the time in anticipatory vomiting, counseling, and uh, especially in children, diversion therapy, I think, uh, divert them from the leak because they are thinking only that they have to undergo chemotherapy. I think divert, diversion therapy will work and in adult, I think, counseling will work. That is what I wanted to add. What do you think, Dr. Lulu? Yeah, in older children, definitely. 
but i was talking about our child who is just 3 to 4 years yeah yeah 3 to 4 there you know the cause and effect be... relationship has not been developed yes only later yes. on only when they are about 7 to 8 they will develop this cause come cause and effect relationship and then yes, this yes. anticipatory vomiting will become a problem yeah yeah yes. so thank you dr lulu i think it was fantastic and people must have really enjoyed and the way they have connected with meenu your patient i think throughout the lecture uh, they must have uh, learnt a lot so we will come back to you in case if they somebody will ask any questions and somebody will send any question to you okay, okay. thank you very much thank you everyone for joining